Uh, in this case, uh, there's a lot to celebrate tonight. And primarily, it is, it is uh, really um, exciting to see that the British people, the, 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 the people of the British Isles from, from uh, you know, with accept acceptance of the Scots, we'll get to the Scots in a minute, but that the people of the British Isles have basically rejected socialism. I mean, this is unequivocally the two issues, there were two issues on the ballot here. There was Brexit, but it was very difficult to know how to vote on Brexit because theoretically, at least, both political parties, both the Conservatives and the Labour Party were pro-Brexit, although the Conservatives were dedicated to Brexit and the Labour were hedging themselves. Boris said that he would decide kind of finally, finally after the election. Um, but so, so Brexit was on the agenda. Clearly Brexit won huge because the one party that was clearly against Brexit, the Liberal Democrats, um, the, the Liberal Party, uh, you know, gained maybe one seat, it looks like, from Mexico polls. Did not do very well. I thought they would do much better. I thought the entire uh, Remain vote would go to the Liberal Democrats, but it didn't. So the Liberal Democrats stayed a small, at this point, insignificant political party in England. And uh, so the numbers are that the Conservatives have picked up, a, a, it looks like, at least, um, well, it's hard. To, the Guardian numbers just suck. Uh, well, it's the Guardian. I don't know why I'm looking at Guardian numbers. Because I figure if I look at the most leftist, I'll get the best, uh, best clue. But right, it, it, it looks like the... Um, the Tories have, uh, have a majority of 86, right? Um, they picked up uh, over 50 votes that will get them to 368. So it's not a majority of 86. I don't know how they get that. Maybe with other parties, but um, the Conservatives are picking up 50 or more seats. They'll have 368 members of Parliament. They need 326 to have a majority. So that for the first time... In, in a few years, they will have an out-and-out -out majority. I read somewhere this will be the best outcome for the Conservatives since 1987. That was Margaret Thatcher. Uh, so we'll see if that really pans out. Again, this is all exit polls, so, so we still don't know. Um, the, but the interesting one is that, that, that uh, the Labour lost 71 vote, 71 seats, 71 seats. So this election, again, was on two issues. Brexit won. Brexit won. Brexit was won, and it won overwhelmingly. The anti-Brexit forces were basically crushed. And second, it was about socialism. Now, Corbyn was a so is a socialist. Not a Bernie Sanders, let's be like Denmark socialist. A real socialist, a socialist, let's nationalize industries socialist, a socialist, let's, you know, own, the state should own the means of production. So, Corbyn wasn't a social democrat in, in the kind of the soft sense of the American socialists. He was an out and out, redistribute everything, um, raise taxes significantly, and nationalize industry, take over the means of production. And the fact that that lost, and that lost big, means that Corbyn is probably out as the leader of the labor movement. The labor, movement would, the labor party in, in the UK will have to move back to a more centrist party, the party of Tony Blair, which is a, a, a major victory. I'm, I'm really interested to see how the vote splits up among young people, because given Given the overwhelming numbers here, it, it suggests that even young people didn't go as overwhelmingly as in, uh, in the last election and as the polls have often suggested uh, to, to the left, that they maybe, that maybe socialism isn't even attractive anymore to the, to the, uh, to the, to the young people. Um, you know, it's, it really is fabulous news that a, a, a real scumbag like Jeremy Corbyn, a socialist, an anti-Semite, um, it, it just a, a, a hater, a nihilist, the worst of the worst, much worse than anything we have in the United States, lost and lost big, lost significant, lost by a landslide. And if these numbers turn out to be right, then there's a lot to celebrate. 
celebrate the, their loss more than anything else. Um, so, so that's great news. The, the, the second part of the great news is that a conservative party, which I think has is a very mixed bag, obviously. I mean, but during this election, they promised uh, to spend money like crazy. They promised to expand the NHS. They promised to expand welfare programs. But a conservative party that has also shed many of its moderates and has become, at least uh, many of the kind of more free market voices within the party are in leadership positions today. Maybe it's the most free market conservative party uh, since uh, the Margaret Thatcher days. It's a conservative party that's certainly significantly better uh, than, it, than it has been for the last probably 20, 30 years, it has won big. It now has to deliver on Brexit. So it, there will be Brexit. There will be Brexit. My expectation is pretty quickly. The, the voters have made their views very clear. I think a lot of it is just let's get it over with. This is, this is dragging on forever. Let's just get it over with. So I think they're going to have to get it over with. Uh, and then the question is, what kind of deal, what is the best deal they can get? And then what do they do with Brexit? I've always said Brexit can be really good for the UK, and it can be a disaster for the UK. And, and I think there's some hope that they do the right thing. There's some hope that, uh, that, they, uh, that they actually uh, move, move the UK in a free market direction, move the UK in a direction that is... Um, that is pro-free markets, and particularly pro-trade, which is tough in a world of, of tariffs. But, but, but even Donald Trump today you know, uh, said he's probably, they're probably not going to raise tariffs on the Chinese and they have some kind of a deal. Um, but in the UK, they really have an opportunity to change the dialogue around trade and to really uh, sign trade deals or bilateral trade deals with all kinds of countries around the world. Ideally, I mean, my ideal, it won't happen, but my ideal would be that they reduce tariffs to zero across the board and just make the United Kingdom a free trade island, uh, that they reduce regulations primarily on, on the financial industry, which is going to be, which is really worried about Brexit and about their ability to stay in England. But if, if they reduce regulations, if they uh, make capital easy to flow in and out, if they, uh, if they, you know, make it so. Here's the point. I, I've said this many, many times. There's certain things about the European Union that are really, really, really good. Free movement of capital, free movement of goods, and free movement of labor, in my view, are excellent features of the European Union. And if they had stuck to that, even a common currency I don't think is a bad idea for the European Union. But if they'd stuck to that, then I think the European Union would be great. The problem is that they've established that now they have to have uniform regulations, uniform laws, uniform rules. And that's the disaster that is the European Union. And the question is, and this is the real question the Conservative Party will have to deal with, is are they willing to really, truly get rid of all the EU regulations that are so cumbersome, so anti-business, so anti-freedom? and really bring about a, a, a relatively f freer market in the UK. Um, so that is going to be a challenge. And can they somehow overcome the damage of losing the free flow of goods, capital, and labor? Can they mimic that by establishing free trade with other countries? And by establishing, if not a zero tariff environment, a very, very low tariff environment uh, for the UK. And, and that's, that's going to be interesting to watch and interesting to see what Boris Johnson does, who he appoints the next government, what kind of ministers he has, and, and what they actually do. Now it's really the question of what actually gets done. We're going to get Brexit. Thankfully, that is, that is going to be over with very, very soon. And then we can move on to see... What is actually going on? What 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 are these? What are they actually going to do uh, with this? So, I mean, the the, the British people, I, I find it really interesting because they are, I think, more intellectual than Americans, and I, I, there is a spirit of freedom. There is a spirit of liberty. There's a spirit of of of, of not quite in the American sense, not quite. Uh, the sense of individualism that America has, but a strong spirit of individualism, maybe more now than ever before. 
And I, I think that is reflected uh, in, um, in this election, in the, the, in the rejection of, of, com of socialism. And now the question is, will it be manifest in the way Boris Johnson rules? Um, also, you know, I'm, I know that I've got a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, friends in, in the UK that are thrilled by what has just happened. So one more downside to Brexit that I think sh I should mention, it's important to mention, given, uh, given this election, given the election results, because one of the one of the points, one of the things that happened during this election, uh, again, according to the exit polls, we'll see if it actually manifests itself, is that the Scottish National Party has gained significant amount of seats, 20 seats. They basically now have 55 of the 59 seats in Scotland. Now, this is a political party dedicated to independence for Scotland. So while the UK is now going to exit the European Union, Scotland is going to want to exit the United Kingdom and, in a sense, rejoin the European Union. So one of the casualties, one of the casualties of the Brexit and of this election could very well be the dismantling of the United Kingdom. And if that happens, it would be really, really, really tragic. I mean, tragic certainly for the Scots, because I, I think, you know, the, the dominant political parties, dominant, you know, politicians in Scotland are, are socialists. Um, so they would suffer the most. But it would be bad for all of the UK. I mean, I am not a believer in small countries. I'm not a believer in, um, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, countries leaving and the establishment of new countries, smaller and smaller countries based on ethnic or ancient geographic borders. I think all of that is nonsense and bad. And, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's destructive. I, I've said many times, I believe there should be fewer countries, not more countries. So I think that's one of the victims of Brexit. But the thing about Brexit is that it now puts the responsibility and now puts the, the burden on the Brits to figure out what they are going to do. What they are going to do. Um, Jennifer asks, what effect do you think a more free Britain has on, on the UK, on, on the United States? I think it does have an impact. I, I think we still look to the UK. Uh, we still look up to the UK in some respect. I think uh, the, the, the British politicians and British intellectuals are still very much respected in the United States. I think if the atmosphere in Britain, if Britain becomes more free, then I think that will have um, a positive impact on uh, intellectuals in the US. The, the flip side of that, the negative aspect of that, is the rise of nationalism. Again, Brexit is a two-edged sword. On the one hand, it gives people more power over their economic fate. The Brits have more power over the economic fate. On the other hand, it can be interpreted as, and has been with some legitimacy interpreted as, a move towards more nationalism, a move towards stopping immigration, a move towards, you know, Brit Brits will decide Britain's fate and Scots will decide Scotland's fate. And uh, so it, it, it has been interpreted as a much more nationalist and to the extent that that is the case, then that is a negative. So again, I, I am very mixed on Brexit. Um, I think it's probably the best thing given, given the European Union and given the direction the European Union is heading. But I fear that much of what is happening is motivated by nationalism. Now, the conservative movement in the UK is not a crazy nationalist movement. It, it, it's not radical. It's not, it, it, it's, not, it, it's not extreme in any sense uh, in, in those directions. Um, in, in some sense, it's more moderate nationalism-wise than I think the populist than some of their voters are. Um, the socialists are really radical socialists. So the fact that they were defeated is definitely a good thing. So it's, again, the, 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 the complete thrashing of Jeremy Corbyn 
is the best political news I've heard in a very, very, very long time. Again, much worse. He is much worse than anything the Democrats in the United States would put up and, and could possibly put up. Tell me the value of selfishness. Use another word, self-esteem. The value of selfishness is that you esteem yourself as a value that you live according to your nature, which means by the judgment of your own mind and you respect your own mind, you respect your own ability to do the right thing, therefore you respect your, the possibility of being a morally virtuous person and you regard yourself as a value worth preserving. Let me bring it down from Kant a little bit to a bromide that I had drummed into me as a child, and maybe you've heard it. Happiness comes from making other people happy. Oh, yes, I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Who hasn't heard it? And that's the trouble. Let's aim at the day when people will not hear it anymore. Because it isn't true, it isn't justifiable, and the first question you would have to ask is, why? Why is it good to want others to be happy, but not yourself? And I suppose you will be told that, well, but they will work for your happiness and not their own. Well, it's like an exchange of Christmas presents that neither party wants, but that you have to exchange presents and you're not allowed morally to do something for yourself. Whereas what I say, you can make others happy when and if those others mean something to you selfishly. If you love them, then you want to make them happy. Fine. If you don't love them, that's not a moral crime. You don't have to love everybody. You cannot love everybody because it's a meaningless expression. You can love only those whom you value. And if they contribute to your happiness, you contribute to theirs. That's fine. But each one of you has to be selfish about it. Supposing somebody were in love with you and said, can I, I can love I you because you're so bad. <coughs> so I sacrifice myself and I'm going to love you. Would you accept that or no, would you say it's the most... No, sir, I wouldn't either. That's the most insulting thing anyone could have said to you. And yet that's what altruism would demand. And there is a great Russian writer who tried to practice it, Dostoevsky, who did marry a poor, uh, stupid little uh, seamstress who, whom he didn't love at all, out of the desire to make her happy. You see, The end of it was she committed suicide. Now that is an altruist practice. That's what altruism leads to. How about it's more blessed to give than to receive? Well, that's obviously the welfare state. That's a clearly motivated slogan. Uh, to please uh, give me something and you'll be blessed, but I will keep your, your material goods. Using the Super Chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time, so I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yourownbookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, your own book show, and, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...